Today on Immortality Now, we'll visit with naturopathic physician and author Dr. Cheryl Burdett to discuss new thinking in the area of menopause and hormones. We'll also talk about the role of inflammation and disease, leaky gut syndrome, reducing toxic body burden, and more. All that in this episode of Immortality Now. Funding for Immortality Now is made possible in part by OnDemed. This therapeutic approach uses biofeedback and pulsed electromagnetic stimulation to help patients improve their stress tolerance. To learn more or to find a practitioner near you, go to OnDemed.net. Hi, I'm Dr. Ron Klatz with uh, this edition of Immortality Now. Today's guest is uh, Dr. Cheryl Burdett. Uh, she's an apropath from Atlanta. Uh, Dr. Burdett has a very interesting and a varied background in both laboratory medicine and clinical medicine. And uh, Dr. Burdett, thank you for being here today. Maybe you could tell the Thanks viewers a little bit about your academic uh, credentials. So as a naturopathic doctor, uh, we do the same four years pre-med and then four years of, of medical school, but at a school dedicated to the study of naturopathic medicine. After that, I did my hospital-based residency at cancer treatment centers. From there, I've been in private practice, but also worked at functional laboratories, and, and, and I own uh, a functional laboratory as well, Dunwoody Labs, where I'm also the educational director. I continue to see patients in private practice at Progressive Medical. We have 25 integrative practitioners all under one roof. On a busy day, we'll see as many as 300 patients. So it's quite the environment for learning and for thriving. There's some new understanding that menopause is much more than just hormone deficiency. Perhaps you could elaborate. Absolutely. So many of us think about menopause as being a drop-off in hormones. And while that's true, it's not the end result for why we have symptoms. When we think about the target of estrogen and what it acts on, it, it tells us what's truly happening. Uh, another way to break this down and think about it is if it was all just estrogen, then we would get breast cancer at 23, not 63. If it was all just estrogen, pregnancy would not be protective, but it would promote. That is not what we see. So it is not estrogen, but the environment that estrogen is in. And what estrogen does is it turns on different antioxidant response elements, things like glutathione peroxidase, and reduces inflammation. Here's another way of saying it. When we take women that have menopausal symptoms and we look at who's having the most symptoms, what we find is it's not the people with the lowest estrogen, but it's the people with the higher level of oxidative stress and inflammation that have the most symptoms. This is exciting to me as a clinician because it means there are different ways we can treat this. We're not just limited to our estrogens and progesterones and testosterone, but we can add to that different therapies that reduce oxidation and reduce inflammation and have another clinically meaningful way of treating people. And so what are the markers that you're looking at specifically? This is another area where we really, uh, we really struggle to know how to measure. Our, is it, should we look in the urine? Should we look in the saliva? Uh, maybe it, it should be serum. And how do we get safety data? So many of us are familiar with looking at estrogen metabolites, and we use those in integrative medicine for years to understand the safety of estrogen. We looked at things like uh, metabolites, the 2-alpha-hydroxyestrone that was supposed to be protective, and mm -hmm. things like a 4-alpha-hydroxyestrone a metabolite that's supposed to be more aggressive. And so these are things that we would measure to dictate safety. Well, it turns out there's a lot of methodological issues with those, and some of those ratios that we looked at, like something known as a 216 ratio, has not continued to present the evidence to really support it as a risk factor for breast cancer like we once thought. That leaves the clinician hungry because we want to know that we are giving estrogens in a safe and effective way. And well, it's so a little confusing because, you know, in, uh, how many different estrogens are clinically significant? Ah, that's a great question. So the woman makes three estrogens, mm -hmm. and then we metabolize those through a number of, of different pathways. First, we make what are called catechols, and those are 2-alpha-hydroxy-4 and 16-hydroxyestrone. But uh, that's not the stopping point. The stopping point is now what are called quinones or semiquinones. And these are really the real damage, or the ones that impact the DNA the most, that put us most at risk for breast cancer. So your question was, well, what do we look at to know if we're getting those? Well, you can't measure semiquinones very well in the blood or the saliva or the urine because they recycle so quickly. And most of that activity is happening in the tissue, not in a specimen that we can easily get to. So minus a biopsy, that becomes pretty difficult. 
well, what dictates whether or not the estrogen moves down the pathway into the most harmful uh, place like that semiquinone, an environment of oxidative stress. So by simply measuring markers of oxidative stress, we can determine whether or not this is a healthy environment to put estrogen into or an unsafe environment to put estrogen How into. How do you know that, the, envir- that the, the oxidative stress that you're measuring is coming from estrogen? Ah, estrogen will, it, 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 will, it can't, could create it, but it could also prevent it. That's the, that's, the, that's the dynamic of estrogen. Again, that's why we don't get breast cancer when we have the highest levels, but we can be more at risk when we have lower levels because it's not the estrogen itself, but it's what the estrogen does. And so estrogen goes into a cell and turns on antioxidant systems like glutathione peroxidase. And so if estrogen goes into a healthy cell with lots of glutathione peroxidase, it'll be youthifying. That's why you see people use it to combat symptoms of aging. However, if you put estrogen into a cell that has low levels of glutathione peroxidase, even it will become oxidized and begin to form addicts with the DNA that shift to a cancerous change. So it's not the estrogen, but the environment that it's in. Well, this is complicated stuff, and it's a good thing (laughs) that you have a laboratory to guide you in this direction. Tell us about your laboratory and what's different about the services your lab provides. Sure. I think it's complicated, but I also... What's the name of your lab? My my lab is Dunwoody Labs. Yes. And while I think it's complicated, I think it reflects a basic truth, like broccoli is good for us and is anti-breast cancer. Why? Why? Because it has compounds that also turn on glutathione peroxidase. So really, I'm just dressing up, uh, eat broccoli, it's preventative. So at Dunwoody Labs, we, l- we look at a number of markers, but we look at markers surrounding oxidized oxidation and oxidative stress, because if you can measure these, then you can measure the environment that the estrogen is going in, and you can tell whether or not you're going to get a healthy endpoint or something that's going to be more dangerous. So two that show up very strongly and favorably in terms of estrogen, metabolite, Catacols, where it's going are 8 OHDG, which is a marker of DNA damage. If we go to PubMed, where they're all the peer reviewed medical research is, and we limit by clinical trials, and we look at 8 OHDG in the past five years, we'll find a thousand different articles that talk about when that is high, we're more at risk for cancer. Another one that shows up favorably is F2 isoprostane. This is a marker of uh, lipid damage or a lipid peroxide. And it's something that we make internally, unlike many that we're used to, like a T-bars, MDA. That's an extrapolation that you do in a lab. And F2 isoprostane is something that we make endogenously and will damage not only our hormones, but will, will damage receptors and keep things from binding appropriately and can be indicative of fats being unhealthy. Okay, so what's the take-home message? What should we be supplementing our diet with, or should we not be? Is this something that's too complicated for someone to do on their own, or is this something that everybody, is there something that everybody should be taking more of? Well, we, we certainly know people on each side of the equation, each side of the spectrum. People that will expose themselves to high levels of toxicants, you know, drink and smoke, and, and, and occasionally they'll do okay in terms of lifespan. And perhaps we could see the opposite. So it all comes down to an individualization. Are you getting the a right level of antioxidants for your system? We all know they're good, but are you getting them from diet and that's adequate, or do you need to supplement? And so the way you can answer that question is to find out if you are damaging your own DNA, if you are damaging your own fats that make up every cell membrane, your brain, the outside of the nerve, and if you're damaging those things, then you don't have the right level of antioxidants. It's a simple urine test and will tell you if you need to add supplementation. So if you are one of those people that needs to add supplementation, I'm going to go back to the basics, and I like broccoli. So there are compounds for broccoli, (laughs) sulforaphanes and glucosinolates, that will turn on glutathione peroxidase and keep the environment reduced or less free radicals. How about taking glutathione directly? Uh, there's controversy there. So some people will say that you cannot orally take glutathione because the brush border or the gut will break it down and you won't see measurable levels. However, there's been a recent shift and we are seeing data the opposite direction that that can be done orally and there are ways around that. So I like an S-acetyl glutathione. The reason I like that is because that acetyl group on the, on the glutathione tricks your gut. And now your gut thinks it's a fat instead of a tripeptide. A tripeptide, it'll chop, chop, chop into the basic amino acid blocks, and that's the reason we thought that you couldn't orally do glutathione. The acetyl makes it look like a a fat, and so now a chylomicron takes it up intact, delivers it to your liver, and puts it back out into circulation. What about SOD? 
superoxide dismutase is near and dear to my heart, and I, I think it's a great marker to look at. When we have better levels of superoxide dismutase, that is associated with anti-aging. This is a way to keep your mitochondria young and fresh and to reduce free radicals or reactive oxygen species, and so knowing how it's acting is important. However, you can see things on both sides of the extremes. With so how do you take SOD? Uh, that one is, this can be difficult to take, and uh, the same argument is made is that it will be broken down at the brush border and you won't absorb it. But we're not limited. We have all kinds of nutrients that will influence the activity of superoxide dismutase. I really like curcuminoids or from turmeric to increase activity of superoxide dismutase. I'm also a big fan of alpha-lipoic acid. It shows up in the literature, and I see it influence it nicely. Okay, and you mentioned about the brush border. We're getting uh, a lot of new literature that's suggesting that uh, uh, leaky gut syndrome is more than just leaky gut syndrome. Again, the inflammatory process is what's uh, involved in this, and that's one of the areas of your specialty as well. Absolutely. So while some of us might feel like we've discovered everything there is to know about leaky gut, I think much of our conversation around it was theoretical. We didn't necessarily see it in the research. We didn't have biomarkers or data points that we could measure to see if it's really a part and if we're influencing that to positive change. Uh, the science is catching up with, with our theory and it turns out we were right that leaky gut is an important component because if the gut becomes leaky that will create a systemic inflammation. Leaky gut increases things like IL-8 and IL-6 and TNF-alpha that can cause a whole host of conditions. But how do you know if leaky gut's playing a role for you or if it just seems like that fits? And so thanks to Alessio Fasano, a researcher at Harvard, he has identified something called zonulin. And zonulin tells tight junctions in the gut mucosa to open up. And so that means that we can measure the phenomenon of leaky gut and we can also measure whether or not our treatments are appropriate. But what his research also showed us is that zonulin goes up before pathology. And so zonulin goes up before that autoimmune condition like MS. So we can see the gut playing a role that's contributing to what your genes are going to express. You're not just waiting for your genes to express a disease that your mom or your dad had, but we can change the environment. And changing the gut reduces inflammation. And inflammation plays a role in many of the things we treat. And how do you see inflammation rising with age? Ah, well, inflammation will rise with age because it gets back to some of your questions about things like superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase. These are antioxidant systems in our body, and this is why when we're young we can have more assault and we can uh, run around more and there's less impact to our system. Our antioxidant systems work quite well, but as we age they decline in function, and when they decline in function it means that there's more free radicals and there's more inflammation. And so that's an important point that you make because many people think that just because I age, I should gain weight, I should feel bad, I should not sleep, I should be in pain. It's not the aging, but it's aging with inflammation. And if we can slow inflammation, we can slow the expression of pathology, and we can, we can slow the, even the presentation of that pathology from occurring. Dr. Burdett, in your uh, practice, what is it that you find has the most impact overall on uh, amelioration of complaints of aging. I mean, what really are maybe the three things that you see most commonly that make an impact? Well, while integrative medicine can be wildly complex with biochemistry and nutraceuticals and compounds that we can use, I think even though it's wildly complex, it can be boiled down to a handful of simple truths. And if we can reduce inflammation, reduce toxic body burden, improve nutrition, and I know you said three, but I'm also going to include decreased mental emotional stress, then there's hardly a pathology that wouldn't do better from that. And so we, we still stick to and, and do our, our, our good diagnosis and our workup. But once we figure out what the condition is, we ask the question why, and often the why is tied up in inflammation, toxic body burden, mental emotional stress, and nutritional deficiencies. And how long do you expect your own life expectancy to be? 120. Only? <laughs>
<laughs> well, let's see. My great aunts are 98 and 96. Yes. And they um, still live by themselves. They won't move in together uh, because she says the other one's bossy. And uh, one still goes to yoga at the YMCA, and one lives on the top uh, floor of a condo. Everyone keeps telling her, move downstairs so you don't fall and hurt yourself. But I say no. I say keep going upstairs. And the reason she's still able to go upstairs is because she keeps going upstairs every day. As long as we keep doing what we've done, then we'll keep doing what we have done. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being part of Immortality Now. My pleasure. I really enjoyed sharing.